So this is, now we've just had our fourth sampling day, and we were going to have some time for questions. Yes. And you had a question. I did. I did. And, and, and there, we have no rules for this, so you should feel free to ask whatever question. If the, I suppose it's possible that we might decline to answer a question, but yeah. we have asked you to be forthright with us, and we think that it's only fair that we would be forthright with you. So we will try to answer. It will either it's the same rules with you. If, if we start to answer a question, we'll try to give you a full answer. And if we say we don't think we should answer that question, then we'll say that explicitly. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Um, well, my first question is, because um, right before the video ended, we were discussing about my proclivity to visual mm -hmm. experiences and um, not really seeing or noticing the words so much as I expected to see. Um, so my question is, do you, is it common in your DS, DES um, studies that you see people who have very strong visuals or is it more so that people are stronger in their words? Um, what is the common thing you see in looking at this sort of stuff What's in your research? So that far? there are big individual differences yeah. and, and uh, pretty much equal in, the, in, that, in that division. I would say that mm -hmm. there's more or less the same number of people who have strong words as there are who have strong imagery. Mm -hmm. We don't have nearly enough people, and we haven't done nearly the cross-cultural and whatever studies that are required to, for me to have, to have given a confident answer about that. Mm -hmm. So I tried to hedge it substantially, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but I would say we have visual people and we have people who have a lot of words. Mm -hmm. And I would say that we have a lot of people, like apparently you, who are mistaken about which category they fall in. And there's no reason why people would actually know. But, uh, mm -hmm. And how would you, because you guys have done the DES experiment on your own selves as well, mm -hmm. right? How, what were your processes? Are you visual or wordy people or how would you describe what you are in terms of this experiment? So about me, I don't know the answer to that question. I've tried to keep myself pretty ignorant about that. I think I have a fair amount of unsymbolized thinking, and when I was a younger person, I think I had some other kinds of experiences, but mm. but I don't, do know the, I don't know the I don't know the answer. I don't I don't know the answer to that because I have systematically avoided mm. trying to answer that question, and the reason for that is so so that I could be so that I could be a good listener for you. Mm. I thought it was probably a good idea for me to bracket my own experience and not really sort of not care about my own experience, mm. because then I wouldn't. Well, I want her to be like me, or I want to relate. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. So I have systematically not mm. examined my own experience much. What I mean by unsymbolized thinking is mm. to be, to be able to th I have the experience, what we're calling here, the direct experience of thinking about something, but without any words or pictures or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you know mm -hmm. what you are? Or do you try to systematically bracket that? I don't. Um, <laughs> I've done this like 37 times, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I don't actually, like I have it all in spreadsheets somewhere, but I don't actually know. Um, I think I have a lot of sensory awareness, so like paying attention to colors and sensations and things like that. Like your physical bodily sensations or like your... Yeah, a lot of bodily sensations, mm -hmm. but then also just like um, like being drawn to the red of that cup, for example. So it's like I'm not really into the cup, I'm not really into the fact that it's coffee, but I'm into the fact that it's, I'm into the red. Yeah. The red is grabbing my attention, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Okay. Um, so I have quite a bit of that and like a decent amount of inner speech. Um, mm -hmm. I don't really have any imagery. I don't know that I would have said I did before or not. I'm not really sure about that, but hmm. I don't think I have any examples of it in our scene. So with this experiment, I know that you guys are trying to get to the, um, are you using the floodlights or footlights of consciousness? Footlights, yeah. Footlights, okay, floodlights, uh -huh. um, So in that, um, is it, does it matter to you how a person gets there? And when you do get to that point in a person's experience, what is it that you're 
Is there some, are you searching for something while they're in the footlight of consciousness? Or are you just trying to prove something? Right. I'm still kind of undetermined what... So those are fair questions. Yes. What, I'm not sure that I understand it. So okay. how do you get sure how, how you get there? Yep. Did, do you mean developmentally? How did how did how did you learn to have visual experience? No, no, no. So like how okay. As the researcher, as you guys mm -hmm. doing this experiment on people like me, and I'm telling you my experience, and we're doing the best that we can to understand the footlight of consciousness for my own self. Mm -hmm. When we're in that, when we're finally in that, we're realizing what my experience was in that moment, what are you guys looking for in the footlight of experience? Of just, my, just exactly that. Whatever is there. Whatever is there. And so when you, when you see whatever is there, what are you taking from it? What are you... That's a great question, and, and and I don't know the answer to that question. I okay. doubt that Alec knows the question. She she could really answer really it herself. But the same question. it seems okay. it seems to me, and Alec can speak for herself. But mm -hmm. it seems to me that it's sort of enough. Okay. And it's and you know why why it's enough. I don't actually know the answer to that. I can I can speculate about it. You know the know thyself is a pretty long-standing right. whatever yeah. and uh, injunction I guess you would say that, that mm -hmm. philosophers have thought for quite some time that mm -hmm. knowing yourself is a good deal and this is sort of one aspect of yourself this is mm -hmm. I'm I, I know myself to be a visual person or I know myself to be a sensory awareness person or, so are whatever. you doing this to help other people better know themselves or do you do this so that for your research you can know the possibility of the self that would seem to be an easy question to answer okay. for us it, or for me it is not an easy question I'm, I would say I am doing it because it seems like a good thing to do what could and it help like what could it I mean, I know how it's helped me mm -hmm. in terms of just being aware, but how could it, how could this become something that um, helps people to be more conscious in their everyday experiences and, I guess, paying mm -hmm. attention? I don't think I know the answer to that. It okay. seems to me that it likely would be a good thing for people to be mm -hmm. more attuned to what's going on with them. Mm. But, but the a prediction of what, of what, why that would be a good thing would be sort of like, the guy who invented the laser. I doubt that he thought, oh, supermarket checkout when, when he watched, some ruby crystal, right. you know, vibrate. Mm. That isn't what that isn't what he was thinking. Yeah. And, mm. and I think we're sort of in that basic science kind of a, mm. kind of okay. a view. Mm -hmm. You just said, well, it seemed valuable to me to find out some things about myself. And that most people who are who are engaged in this exercise think mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. and and seem to be honest of, and re, re, relating it, and mm -hmm. seem to be genuinely thinking that, that I got some value out of this, mm -hmm. even though all we really did we, we we haven't this has not been a therapeutic exercise. This has been a let's just see whether we can get Lena's experience right on. We've actually probably only looked at about 11 beeps or something mm -hmm. like that. Right. Really not very many. So you, one of what I've noticed and what I've learned so far is um, in doing this exercise, you've made it very clear to um, bracket away our own hypothesis or theories of why something is occurring mm -hmm. um, and mainly to just focus on um, what's occurring? That's exactly right. Okay. Couldn't say it better myself. Okay. And do you find that it's easy for people to even know what's occurring? Or do you think it's easier for people to theorize about what's occurring? Because I don't know that it is even possible to not do both or mainly just theorize. Because I, my theory is that we create these mental representations and mm -hmm. perceptions and we base our whole lives on these types of things and mm -hmm. I don't know. 
we don't sure. get very philosophical, but I'm just wondering what you think of that. Like, do you think it's possible to to have that clear clarity of knowing what's happening in this exact moment without theorizing about it? So let me let me ask you a question, and, which and and then we'll come back and answer that question. So, okay. so do you think that it's possible that at the moment of all these beeps, mm -hmm. you, yeah. so we've had a dozen beeps or something like that, you are really talking to yourself, mm -hmm. and there's no, I'm really talking to myself, but then I make up this story about wavy images or, or whatever, and, yeah. and, and, and that just is, that's a red herring and away from the, the talking to myself. Do you think that's possible? Can you ask the question in a different way? I want to see if I'm So let's let's think about the last beep that we were talking about. Okay. So the last beep mm -hmm. that was the uh Well the last beep was that was the last Well there there was a lot of stuff going yeah. on in, in that last beep. And of the stuff that was going on, mm -hmm. there was no words other than I'm hearing what the NPR That's guy was talking about. Yeah. I would like to know what do you think about the possibility that really there was a lot of Lena words going on at that time, but for some reason you're not reporting that at the moment of the beep? Do you think that's possible? I couldn't say that it is not possible um, because I don't have a very objective way of looking at myself. I don't feel objective when I look at myself. I don't. I guess I could be if I was like looking at myself while looking at myself. I'd have to go third person on myself kind of thing, if that makes sense. And that would mean I would have to shift my state of consciousness at the time of the beat to then look at myself looking at myself kind of thing. Or looking at myself as I'm experiencing reality, mm -hmm. rather than it's like I'm in the wave when I'm experiencing, and then the second the beep happens, I kind of have to go above the wave mm -hmm. and look down at myself and say, mm -hmm. "Oh, yeah, this is this is what was happening. This is what you were experiencing. This is what you're feeling. This is what you were visualizing." Um, is it possible that I'm missing out on the words that I'm choosing to have? Yes. Um, because I, I can't say that anything for certain about what I'm doing or what I'm feeling. You know, I feel the human experience is too hard to understand because I'm, we're all super subjective, it seems like. But maybe there is, I would like to know in my own personal life, and maybe this is something that this experiment can do, is my consciousness just this pure, observant being that we all have, and it's just a matter of knowing that it's there and bringing it forward. So I don't know what consciousness is. I don't either. And I want to know though <laughs> if there is. But what I would what I would say yes. is that even in this particular beat, which was a pretty complicated beat, mm -hmm. you were quite confident in describing the visual aspect of this. You said yes. there was no question about it. This guy was going around, it was oval shaped, there were microphones, I could see the cords, yep. I couldn't see the walls, the walls were wavy or the walls were wavy. You there was and you didn't say at the same time. I was saying to myself, quote, this is a weird guy going around and touching all those microphones, unquote. Mm -hmm. There which is the kind of thing that I think you would have said early on before we did this kind of study. Right. That, that you engaged in that kind of stuff. I feel like I do, I, it, in thinking about what you're now saying about words and whatnot, when it comes to my own inner experiences of things, or like if I'm hearing something or just purely trying to comprehend, there's this visual representation, um, I think it's when I sit in a certain mindset that the words decide to come out. Um, I don't know that, I'm, I think I'm realizing that words m might not be so much part of human my human nature. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just something that 
I've overlain, I overlay on my experience at certain times, I mean, just seeing from what we've discovered so far. Um, and I am confident about my visual experience that I really see those things in my head. Mm -hmm. And, but it's hard for me to, um, I'm realizing it's difficult for me, and I don't know if this is something that you experience in yourself, or you experience in yourself, or any of your other um, participants experience, that pure, you know, unfiltered awareness of their inner experience without the overlaying of all the other junk that comes with being a person, you know? my past experiences play a part in how I mm -hmm. experience things and genetics and all these other factors and stuff. Does that... So th this yeah. this conversation, this piece of the conversation, yeah. can't start with a question that yeah. you were asking whether you could bracket, whether yeah. it's possible to bracket presuppositions or something like that. Yeah. And the answer to that question is, I don't think it's possible to do that. Well, I think it is possible actually to do it perfectly. I don't think we do it perfectly. I think. Nirvana probably is being able to bracket presuppositions perfectly. Nir I, nirvana, nirvana. Yeah, uh, like enlightenment. Oh, true, okay, true, okay. True I was going to say the same thing. I heard. True, true yeah. enlightenment yeah. is probably the ability to see things as they absolutely are without right. theories, without theory without or without or or right. And and I don't have any personal connection to people or to to myself. I'm not claiming to have arrived at enlightenment. By any means, right, right, right. The, but what I, I, I think that short of enlightenment, I think there is a more or less version of it, and so I think people can get caught up in their own theories, yeah. and in a in a quite convincing way, yeah. in convincing for themselves. I mean, this is the way it is. There's absolutely no question about it, mm -hmm. and if that doesn't comport with sort of reality, then I think that is some kind of a problem for them. Mm -hmm. What kind of a problem? I don't actually know, but I think, it, so what I, maybe problem isn't the right word, I, I think there's some value as a general rule <coughs> to have your theories comport with what's actually going on with you. So I think you have a theory, you had a theory of yourself as being verbal, which probably was not in line with your actual experience. What that does to Lena as a person, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. But it can't be good, it seems to me, or maybe it's good. No, maybe, I, maybe it's maybe it's good. I don't actually know the answer to that. Or maybe it's good to know that you're a visual person when it's oh, like you see it as I'm not disappointed that I'm not verbal or anything. Yeah, yeah. But um, oh, what was I going to say? So in a sense, like from what I'm understanding, and tell me if I'm on the right path of knowing what this is here. Mm -hmm. In a way, you're, this might sound a little weird, but like piercing through the veil of Maya, like the veils that we kind of put over ourselves in life that we get from experience or that we get from our environments or even genetics, and we sort of uplift that delusion sort of to I think experience. That's, exactly, that's great. I think that's exactly right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I could see though for some people that, that it can be very scary because then you have to really reckon with like your true self, you know, your true nature. Delusions are yeah. pesky. Yeah. I think another thing that you're kind of asking yeah. is something like can people do this? Or, or sort of like are people good at this? Or and I think that's yeah. why we do the whole beeper procedure. That's why we mm -hmm. kind of give you like these optimal conditions because we're not naturally good at it. And somebody asks like, what kind of person are you? Mm -hmm. You're probably not likely to like freeze time, pay attention without presuppositions, and apprehend your experience, and then tell them you're going to say, oh, I think I'm pretty. I got this internal monologue, or I have whatever. Right. And where all that stuff comes from, I think we come by it honestly. But I don't know through what filters we arrive at these theories yeah. but then you, you it seems like you almost need something like the beeper mm -hmm. and all of its structure and its precision about the moment of the beep and the opportunities to do these interviews right. again and again and build some skill before you can say mm -hmm. I think I'm kind of like this without all the theory mm -hmm. about genetics and blah, 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 on top of it so in doing all this and because I understand the objective um, of the, uh, the purpose of Bieber and the purpose of this, I think, a little bit better. 
but I think I still have a little trouble understanding um, your what you're looking for <laughs> in terms of are you looking for enlightenment? Are you looking for an enlightened person? Do you want to meet an enlightened person in this experience? Are you looking for your enlightenment for yourself in this? Or, or is it just completely you're not looking for anything, you're just seeing what's out there? It's like you're just this beacon, like you're sending out a signal, and you're like, hey, come check us out. Let's try to figure out some cool things about consciousness. I'm just wondering. Where's that? I, I would be <laughs> delighted to be enlightened, maybe. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> that would happen. Awesome. Yeah, right? I would be delighted to find somebody who was enlightened. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I'm capable of recognizing me. You might be the enlightened person, and I wouldn't. Oh, and I wouldn't, wouldn't say that. And I wouldn't. <laughs> and I wouldn't know it. Maybe my yeah. brother, though. I have to say, he's an interesting feller. Maybe mm -hmm. he'll do this with you guys. Yeah. He's the, so I'm. I'm oh, I don't think it's fair to say that I'm in the pursuit of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're asking a good question and a fair question and a difficult question, but it's, some, it's something like when I consider what I could do in the world, mm -hmm. this seems like a good thing to do. Yeah. And and I can't. I don't. I don't. It's hard for me to defend it any more than that. Oh, I don't want you to defend yourself. I just. I want to. I guess I just need to understand the driving force of this, you know, and what it means. And I personally think it's great. I think it's this is a great project. Mm -hmm. Just just that reason alone, being able to do something good, like bring consciousness to people's everyday experience, is a great thing in of itself. That's all it needs to really mm -hmm. be. But and um, I think it's yeah. for at least for yeah. me it's more basic than that. Like I okay. I think it's great if you yeah. learn about your truth, but like I in a in as loving way as I can say it, I also don't really care. Like yeah. if a participant leaves and yeah doesn't is not enlightened or is doesn't find this therapeutic or right it still seems really good to me and maybe that's like a, it's just interesting or it's so we go you, back and forth about like what how can we articulate the value of this yeah. and i don't have the words yet but yeah the kind of like the proof is in the pudding like i never leave this room after an hour of struggling with people and sometimes like Mm. Oh, like this, we just can't even just agree on the word for experience, you know? Yeah. And it always feels worthwhile. Mm. It's, it's never feels like a waste of time. Yeah. And I think that... And it never feels dishonest. And it never mm. feels dishonest. And maybe 200 years from now, we'll actually know or whatever about people, and then we'll be able to say, mm. this is how it's useful, or maybe ten, two years from now, I don't know, but... Mm. I sometimes think of us as like the gap, like we're like gathering the tomatoes or something, and somebody else is gonna make the sauce. Maybe we're gonna make the sauce, but mm. but it's good to gather the tomatoes. Yeah. Okay, I get that, and I respect that. And, and I totally agree with all of that. And and it really comes down to I we think I think we think about what all, all the possibility of that we could do, mm -hmm. and this seems pretty good. Mm. And it, and and you know, part of it is that it's genuinely interesting, mm -hmm. you know, to to contemplate wavy, yeah. wispy back, right. wispy visual backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think we've run across that. I can't. It's very cool. But <laughs> un indeterminate visual backgrounds is something right. which we see relatively frequently. That mm -hmm. people, people like I think you talked about translucent skin and facial characteristics something like that. that's fairly frequent because mm -hmm. people don't know about characteristics and they so they make mm -hmm. visualizations and leave out some details or whatever that's mm -hmm. garden variety visual experience from my point of view yeah the waviness is is new and 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 so part of it is the it, it's it's like a crossword puzzle or something like that for, for me maybe for Alec but it's a genuine puzzle. Mm -hmm. What is it that Lena means when she says wavy, mm -hmm. wispy? When she says wispy, what is it that, that she means by that word? Mm -hmm. Does she mean anything by that word? Is it just she's just being sloppy, mm -hmm. or, or is or does she have something in particular in mind? And what's what's that like about her experience? Mm -hmm. And then we'll try to figure that out, and then we'll try to figure out whether that was really believable, and whether you know. I rush into conclusions about that, and mm -hmm. so it's a it's an examination of what Lena meant and 
what's an examination of wh whether Russ was too quick to go in that direction, or is he holding back, or whatever. I mean, it's it is a uh, it's a massively intellectual undertaking. Yes. And that doesn't seem yeah. quite a fair way to say it, but it it involves all of the faculties that I've got. Let's yeah. put it that way, to try to figure out whether this is a genuine understanding of what Lena is saying as best she can about her inner experience mm -hmm. without sweeping any of that crap under the rug. Yeah, yeah. So and that seems like a worthwhile thing to do. Yes, yeah. Um, to truly understand what somebody is saying, that's, yeah. that's a difficult thing. Um, just because it can mean anything. That's right. But um, last question is, um, so my, I brought up the whole like piercing the veil of my and all that and kind of uplifting or lifting the myriad of different things that we use as a human being to cope with every with our everyday experience of things, whether it be relying on a past experience or relying on a certain belief system that kind of creates how our experiences will be to us or how they will seem to us, which is the delusion. So we can't really see true reality or our own true nature or maybe that is part of our true nature is being delusional i don't know but in doing that <laughs> I know, i'm ranting a little bit but in the veil of maya or when you do that to be with people like help them or kind of show them a little bit that oh, okay these are our preconceived ideas these are our theories mm -hmm. now let's just like take that curtain off or in another way let's put <coughs> that blanket down like it's like it's like a comfort mm -hmm. a little bit to some of us i would say do you find that when kind of trying to remove that that it causes anxiety for people because mm. you did say something like could it be hurtful to me that i'm i'm not this verbal person i don't have this amazing inner dialogue maybe i'm not this like super talky talky person inside and having this amazing intellectual conversation with myself like Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't feel disappointed. I feel oh wow okay that's cool. I'm I'm visual you know. But so so it's a great question okay. and and so and it's a two part answer. Okay. The first part of the answer is that people resist. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good. Point. They're having the having the veil lifted. Why do you think that is? Because they're delusions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because so, people are connected okay. to their delusions. That's what is a delusion. So people okay. resist that. All right. So the bracketing of presuppositions is not an easy task. Mm -hmm. And and but I would also I would also say mm -hmm. it seems like there should be a risk mm -hmm. to having a delusion removed. But I can't remember a single time I've been doing this for fifty years where where I thought somebody walked out of here and said, geez, that was a mistake. I should I shouldn't have done that. That that was mm -hmm. or that or that felt worse as a result of it. Right, right. Yeah. And you know, I, I think I think people know what the truth is, and they, know, they people value the truth. And if you can lift a, if if you can genuinely lift the veil a little bit and mm -hmm. let people see themselves as they really are, mm -hmm. yeah. that is in my experience so far. And and you know, I've got no reason to think that tomorrow is going to be different, or right. it's not going to be different. Yeah. But I can. I can honestly say I've never seen a, I've never seen it be a bad deal, yeah. Yeah. and 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 the 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 and the reason for that is I think because what we're what what we're discovering about you your your wispy images mm -hmm. is I think a genuine characteristic of your experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is not what psychology in general does. You know, psychology gives you a test and then says, "Well, here's a score in a test," and that score is definitely a misrepresentation of you. Mm. And it, and at its absolute best, it's a comparison between you and somebody else. Mm. And and people, people are not necessarily, and 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 in actuality, it's a misrepresentation of you in very important ways because those tests are of a limited right. validity. The deal here is your wispy images is a pretty high fidelity view of Lena. She's got wispy imagery. Uh -huh. 
Girl. And for, for whatever whatever advantageous, we're not saying this is a good thing to have whispering imagery, a bad thing to have it, but we are saying looks like that's what what lean is. And we're actually okay. even being honest about that. We're saying, well, you know, we've, we've got 12 experiences or whatever it is, and three or four of them had wispy images in it, so yeah. looks like that's a common thing. But maybe we were just unlucky and got these, and, and if we did another 24 images, we'd never see any of them again. Mm -hmm. All of that stuff is, mm -hmm. is part of the honest description. Yeah. And my experience has been that that people are happy to encounter their own actual inner experience. When it's really their own actual inner right. experience. And right. it's not it's not well my favorite thing is wispy images and I'm gonna force you to have wispy images. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is I think what what a lot of psychology is, a lot, of, a lot of interpersonal right. reaction is. Right, yeah, and do you, so I kind of have two short questions now. Um, so do you think that there, well the first most question is actually, um, okay, I lost that question, but I'll ask the other one. Do you think that there are people who can experience, or have you learned of people in your experiments, um, that people, there are people out there who can have a true idea of their experience, their, they have the closest experience of true reality in terms of this experiment? Have you met anyone that can really experience reality in a truthful way versus laying over those things? Or is it, or is it more so you teaching people how to bracket those theories that we develop? So I I've, I've I, the answer to your question, the honest answer to your question is I don't know the answer to that question. I have sampled with a few people who teach enlightenment skills and it's hard to know exactly, you know, I, yeah. I'm not the kind of a guy who can say, well, this person's enlightened and that one's, that one's not. Mm -hmm. well, so we, we, the, this study is not about the connection between experience and reality. Mm -hmm. I think think reality is more complicated than anybody in these, any experience. You, at the moment that you're having a pretty complex experience that involves a wavy, uh, guy uh, wavy guy touching microphones and the residual of <laughs> being pissed at your husband for not turning the, <laughs> turning the, mic, uh, the windshield wipers off or whatever, mm -hmm. there, were, there were an infinite almost number of other things that could have been going on at that at that time, the temp temperature in the in the room, or the feel of the car seat on your backside, or you know, we could list and list and list and list and list. For whatever reason, genetic experience or whatever, you were interested in microphone stuff in the way that you were interested in microphone stuff, and you were interested in the residual of a windshield wiper or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not given to me or to us, I think, to judge whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It, it's about whether it is a thing, and that's where we're, that's what we're about. Okay, so it's more looking at what's most important or prominent for that person in their experience. Right, mm -hmm. okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and, that no, is, and nothing more than that, really. Right. Okay. And that is different for every person. It is. That's right, and different for you, you know, from, yeah. one, from one time to the next. Yeah. You've got some characteristics, maybe, right. visual, right. visual stuff, but, and, you know, we Do are... Do you think it would go, it would be, oh yeah, this was my other question, because you said that in psychology, you, know, you get a test, you get a score, and then they compare that score to others, and then that's how they come up with all their stats, and this and that and the other. Do you think that um, in doing what you do, that treating people as a collective number is accurate or do you think that it's more we should be treating people more as individuals and not putting them in terms of a your mm -hmm. bell curve like this is normal this is not normal and this is here and this is there so if I knew the answer to that question I'd be a really smart guy <laughs> the, I th I think there is some fundamental risk 
of objectifying people and com com being fundamentally comparative about people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I I worry. I guess you would say I worry about what that does to people. Right. Yeah. But I'm. I'm not enlightened. I, mean, I don't know the truth with a capital T. Maybe that is absolutely. Maybe psych, maybe 2020 psychology is absolutely the pinnacle of human consciousness and always will be. That doesn't seem like that to me, but mm -hmm. I'm not in a position to know the answer to that. So, and I know you may not know the answer. To, well, you couldn't know because you weren't born in the 1800s. But would you say that? People from the past, you know, and you can relate it to as far back as you can remember when you were growing up, or as far back as you know what you've learned from history. Would you say that people from back then till now there has been any shift in consciousness? Like, you know, there was the Enlightenment era, and there was like that whole boom of new thinking, and then there was, you know, the um, Einstein days and you felt like scientists were coming out with all kinds of crazy stuff and now we're kind of just in this weird place where it's like there's not really one person that is doing anything like that. I mean I guess Tesla like he's got a bunch of geniuses working for him and he's kind of the fi financier but is he the Einstein of our days? I don't think so but I don't know him personally so I couldn't say so do you feel that there is a conscious consciousness evolution that happens in humanity or do you think we're rather than evolving do you think we're devolving I don't know the answer to that okay. I don't know either I think yeah. it would have been totally interesting mm -hmm. for me you know, for us for the world to have done this kind of study yeah big time but well mm -hmm. in 2005 before the iPhone and now everybody says that we, you know, we fractionated our or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and, and do that experience to do that study again. Yeah. Well, that would have been interesting. Yeah. So, how do you feel the iPhone has? I don't know the answer to that. Oh, right. But it, you do know it's done something to our ability to, of our of our consciousness, our ability to be conscious. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know. I know. We've we uh, we see That's a lot of people who are scrolling. We see a lot of scrolling. So mm -hmm. whatever scrolling is. Yeah, which I don't think we really understand. As so an like experience. It, it doesn't seem like much, I'll tell you that. Like yeah. it doesn't seem like a, it ha it lacks the richness without being judgmental or whatever mm -hmm. of like the inner seeing that mm -hmm. you're engaged in. It's it's a lot le less than that. Mm -hmm. So well, whether that's good or bad. Right, we, right. we don't know, but it's, it just doesn't have a lot of like experiential Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, qualities, whatever. So, would you say that in a lot of your DES, DES experiments, that in the people that you do it with, a lot of their beeps are interrupting their scrolling? Is that what you mean? We got, yes. Okay, yeah. a lot of interruptions like a, with a good chunk or yeah. pretty, a pretty big chunk, and, and more recently. Yeah. Are you guys scrollers? Like, do you scroll or do you scroll on Facebook or Instagram? Oh, of course. Okay. I don't. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to quit. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. It's hard. But I got three kids, so at least I'm sure. It could be when right. they're wearing the beeper. And they, but, yeah. the, but we're, I mean, we're catching a, like a, such a high percentage. But it's certainly more than just when yeah. people, like, people are doing this a lot. And yeah. it is grabbing their experience mm -hmm. in a way that the experience is of scrolling, mm -hmm. not of visualizing or imagining or saying, or so like scrolling is it. Yeah. And what that means experientially is mm -hmm. so kind of nebulous to me, but it, it's a thing. Or what is it? What does the internet mean to our experience? Like, I, I mean, I know when I'm scrolling, and this is just a theory, that when I am scrolling, there's, it's a mental experience, it's a mentally emotional experience, mm -hmm. and that's enough sometimes for me to be like, oh, I'm done, I'm going to bed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, reading all kinds of crazy stuff, people's weird conversations, and you know, yeah. memes, and. From what views. I would <laughs> say, from. Yeah. My impression of the scrolling is for most people, most of the time, it's a pretty mindless thing. Right. Yeah. It's they're not really engaged with what they're reading. Uh, they're just distracting yeah. and escaping. Yeah. Right. It's less than reading. It's less than having an emotion. I guess less, you yeah. know, I don't mean that in a... I hear you. But it doesn't have that. It doesn't have reading involved in things. Well, okay. Last thing, and then I'll 
maybe to it. In my um, philosophy class, we were learning of that philosopher um, Heidegger and his three fundamental ontological aspects of the sign, which means to or to be or the being. And um, the last one out of the three, one, the last one is victimization. And that type of state of being is the person who is constantly escaping their reality um, and distracting themselves which then puts them in a place of living inauthentically. Mm-hmm. And so would you say that the scrollers are living inauthentically? Or is that hard to judge? Because you don't want to judge necessarily, because then it kind of skews the process of dealing with this sort of experiment. I, I don't want to make a judgment about the, yeah. about the scrollers' inauthenticity. But yeah. What I would say is that Delusions block authenticity, mm-hmm. and presuppositions are delusions, which means presuppositions block authenticity. Which means, in your case, that your view of yourself as a verbal person mm-hmm. is, in some degree, I inauthentic. I think. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Whether that's exactly what Heidegger meant by inauthenticity, that would be a harder question for me to answer. But, uh, mm-hmm. but, and, and we're circling back to one of your earlier questions. It seems to me that it's sort of value to be authentic to yourself, mm-hmm. which is what the know thyself deal is. And well, and that's what too is some of these people that you we talk about in terms of the scrolling and the whole cell phone thing, and like we all do it, of course, I'm mm-hmm. mindless in that myself, that the only, one of the reasons why a person would scroll is to distract themselves from, from their environment. Um, or if it's not to distract themselves, it becomes the distraction, or it becomes, the distraction is their experience. And um, sure. so I'm wondering if there is in some way the delusion that we experience in every in our lives with our different perceptions of life, if in a way that we are distracting ourselves from the delusion that we live in, and that I think that's it's a, hard. A, that's right. I mean, we we are just describers. <laughs> this yeah. room, I don't know. I would I would I will take this step in the direction of that question. That is, I think mm-hmm. that the inner experience and external experience are skills that you learn and practice and whatever. Mm-hmm. So your visual skill involves wispy whatever, and that may have something to do with some gene on some chromosome or whatever, but it's whatever, for whatever reason, it's something that you have figured out how to do. Yeah. And scrolling is a skill, yeah. and people do those skills for whatever reason that they do skills, but it's not our job to judge that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sorry. 